Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we have our weekly look at the numbers, trends, and latest news about COVID-19 with AMA's Chief Health and Science Officer, Dr. Mira Irons. In Chicago, I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Irons, big news this week from AstraZeneca, a potential fourth vaccine option, and also some confusion about the date it released. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, absolutely. It's been a little bit of up and down with with uh, this information. Um, so AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine um, was found to be 79% effective against symptomatic COVID-19 and 100% effective against severe disease in a long-awaited U.S. study, according to the results announced by Monday by AstraZeneca. Um, however, and the plan then was that the the they were going to um, uh, complete the paperwork um, for an application for um, an emergency use authorization for the FDA. However, on the heels of that announcement came a highly unusual statement released after midnight from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases that said it was concerned AstraZeneca used outdated information from the large scale trial when it reported the results on Monday and this is a quote, which may have provided an incomplete view of the efficacy data. What does that, uh, can I just ask you, what does that mean, outdated information? Do you have any insight into No, that? I'm sorry, I, I, I really don't. And you know, this is, you know, this is uh, the, this is really the role of the U.S. Data Safety and Monitoring Board um, to work with the company at this point to review the data and release the updated information as quickly as possible. Um, you know, as of Monday, as I said, the company was preparing to apply for an emergency authorization from the FDA, but the shot may not actually be needed in the U.S. as it would likely not become available before May. And now this new concern about the data could add to that timeline. And this um, is on, uh, you know, on top of you know, a rocky last week with uh, concerns about safety in Europe. Can you talk a little bit more about how that situation is resolved? Yes. Um, so, you know, in Europe, you know, what we heard was that European regulators, after um, some uh, safety concerns about um, the increased incidence of uh, thromboembolic phenomenon, um, eventually said that, uh, eventually cleared the disease, uh, cleared the vaccine, I'm sorry, um, although some countries um, are using it and others are still paused, I believe. Um, and with regards to the U.S. trial, you know, although no clinical trial is large enough to rule out extremely rare side effects, AstraZeneca reported that its study turned up no serious safety issues. Um, government officials and public health experts expressed hope that the results would improve global confidence in this vaccine. And, you know, even if the vaccine is not used in the United States, um, because we have enough supply of the other vaccines, receiving emergency authorization from the FDA, whose rigorous review process is considered the global um, gold standard would be an important milestone for AstraZeneca. You know, the trial itself had more than 32,000 participants. It was the largest test of its kind for the shot. And another unique aspect of the trial is it showed that the vaccine offered strong protection for older people who had not been as well represented in earlier studies. Now, again, this is all qualified because of the, the current concerns. However, uh, you know, I have to say that the FDA and especially the External Advisory Committee, the VRBAC, um, look at all of the data very closely. It will once again, once they convene the VRBAC, be a public meeting. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions and a close look at the data. Um, and um, the one thing I, I, I do feel confident is that the rigorous process that has occurred with the prior vaccines um, will, will occur with this one also um, once that application is submitted. Well, it does seem like states are accelerating uh, you know, their uh, vaccines uh, expanding eligibility to try to increase the pace of vaccinations. You know, are we seeing this in the numbers and are we on track to meet that goal that President Biden uh, suggested for May? Yeah, I, I think we are. You know, we do continue to stay on track. You know, nationally, about 25% of the U.S. population has received at least one shot. Um, the CDC on Monday said about 82.8 million people have received at least one dose and about 44.9 million have been fully vaccinated. The other thing that's important to note is that the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine is now um, integrated into the distribution systems, and those are single-dose vaccines. So, you know, one 
once people are vaccinated with that one, they immediately go into that fully vaccinated side of the ledger. Um, so I think those numbers are going to start coming up. Um, you know, we the providers are administering about 2.49 million doses per day on average as of Sunday, but I'm sure, you know, you've heard the media reports, there have been some 3 million um, dose days. Um, so if the country maintains its current pace of vaccinating people, about half of the total population um, would at least partially be vaccinated around mid-May um, and hopefully nearly all around um, late July, assuming the supply pledges are met and vaccines are eventually available to children. That's, ec that's excellent news. And we are seeing states continue to increase eligibility. You know, what are the trends that you're seeing there? So, you know, West Virginia joined Alaska and Mississippi on Monday and making everyone older than 16 eligible. Um, New York said residents older than 50 could sign up for a shot starting this week. And Tennessee announced all adults will be eligible starting April 5th. Um, the White House also announced on Monday another federally run vaccination site, which will open in Washington state and be able to administer up to 1,200 shots per day. You know, the, the, the issue now is that we have to make sure that um, sites are available available um, in places where everyone can go and get their vaccines um, so that access is available for everyone. And it does appear that we are kind of we're in a race against the time because, you know, we're reading reports from the CDC about concerns about a, quote, preventable surge. You know, what are you seeing right now in terms of the trends of cases and deaths? So, you know, the current, you know, the numbers today are that 29,870,135 people have been diagnosed with a COVID infection and uh, 542,900 93 um, into people have died of COVID. Um, you know, on Sunday, at least 444 new COVID deaths and 34,236 new cases reported. We do know that reporting is usually down on weekends. Um, so that if you look at the seven day average over the past week, that has continued to kind of stick at that 54,407 cases per day. You know, it's a decrease of about 7% from the average two weeks earlier, but but, you know, it's it's that number has basically been flat um, for two weeks and that number is too high, um, you know, um, because that means that there's still active um, disease um, in the community. Um, persistent outbreaks in the Northeast and Michigan have offset progress in other parts of the country. Um, Michigan especially is adding about twice as many cases a day as it was two weeks ago. New Jersey leads the country by a, large, a wide margin. Um, you know, daily death reports, um, which have stayed stubbornly high long after the post-holiday surge are, have finally started to come down sharply. The country is averaging about a thousand newly reported deaths a day, the fewest since November. And in the last seven days, in the last week, the seven day average has dropped um, 30 percent. Um, so so we're hopeful, you know, that things are continuing to go in the right direction, although the numbers are still high enough so they can move. There is concern, obviously, about kind of loosening of restrictions as uh, kind of contributing to this flattening out. And even in some places like Michigan, you say, leading to an increase. What other kind of key trends are you noting? Uh, why don't we start first with, uh, you know, a lot of action down in the state of Florida. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, the spring break is a, is a big driver of concern. We've all seen the pictures um, where we all know this story well enough to know that, um, you know, we should be worried. Um, in South Beach, um, police struggled to control overwhelming crowds over the weekend. Officials in Miami Beach decided on Sunday to extend an emergency curfew for up to three weeks. Um, you know, Miami-Dade County, which includes Miami Beach, has recently endured one of the nation's worst outbreaks. Um, and the state is thought to have the highest concentration of the B117 variant, which is the, the contagious, the more contagious and possibly more lethal um, variant first identified in, in Britain. You know, the concern is obviously um, what happens when all these spring breakers return home um, and whether that could fuel another surge. Yes, uh, on top of the trends that we're seeing in travel, just reading that we're, you know, over the weekend seeing actually a peak since last March. So uh, a lot of risk there, uh, I can see with people traveling and congregating and uh, breaking the rules. 
So uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep our eye close on that data. Uh, any more news about the variants you mentioned, uh, some of them coming, uh, becoming predominant and you know, more contagious and potentially more lethal? What are we seeing there? Um, so, you know, Dr. Walensky, the, the head of the CDC, addressed this at the same White House briefing on Monday. You know, she did say that the virus variants are making up a bigger share of cases, and the CDC is scaling up its efforts substantially to track down the variants, and that will continue to grow, in large part due to the $1.75 billion in funds for genomic sequencing um, in the American Rescue Plan. Um, you know, on the CDC site today, um, the UK variant, the B1 17 variant is in 51 jurisdictions in the United States, so it's pretty much saturated. It's it's in the United, you know, in across the United States. The South African variants in 26, and the Brazilian variant is in 15 jurisdictions. So um, the variants are are in our communities. Um, Dr. Walensky told lawmakers last week that between 10 and 14,000 test samples were being sequenced each week to locate variants and that they're aiming for about 25,000. Um, but, but I'd like to quote um, uh, something that she said, which I think really just um, is an important message. You know, we are at a critical point in this pandemic. We must act now. I'm worried that if we don't take the right actions now, we will have another avoidable surge, just as we're seeing in Europe right now, and just as we are so aggressively scaling up vaccination. Um, you know, Europe tends to be about three to four weeks ahead of us. And, um, you know, if, if history repeats itself, um, you know, they are several countries countries in Europe are on lockdowns currently. Um, so we're just hoping that people hang in there. Absolutely. I uh, don't want to see a repeat of that. Um, last question, any big news or statements from the AMA that we want folks to be aware of? Yep, two of note. Um, so on March 16th, the AMA applauded the Biden administration and acting promptly to update Medicare payment rates for COVID-19 vaccine um, administration. Um, and on March 17th, the AMA urged Congress to support legislation that would prevent arbitrary across the board Medicare cuts that threaten the viability of physician practices during the pandemic. The letter to Speaker Pelosi and Minority Leader McCarthy points out that physician practices still face overwhelming financial challenges and pressures associated with higher overhead costs, like the cost of personal protective equipment, and lost revenue due to fewer patient visits and delayed elective procedures during the pandemic. Injecting additional uncertainty into the healthcare system is an unnecessary distraction during a time when physicians and others are focused on fighting the pandemic, the letter said. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Irons, and sharing your perspectives. We'll have you back next week for another look at the trends and data. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care. Uh, for more information on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. 